Ok. Uh, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Este, a nombre del comité organizador, les doy, les doy a todos la cordial bienvenida a esta tercera conferencia magistral en el marco del primer coloquio de estudiantes de posgrado en estudios urbanos y regionales. Esta conferencia lleva por nombre Urban Structure and Mobility, The Past, Present and Future of Job Location y será impartida por el profesor Richard Shermur de la Universidad de McGill, Canadá, a quien agradecemos haber aceptado participar. Thank you, Richard. La dinámica de la presentación será la siguiente. En primer lugar, voy a realizar una breve reseña del trabajo del profesor Shermur. Después le daré la palabra aproximadamente por un él tiene el tiempo más o menos de una hora y posteriormente daremos paso a una ronda de preguntas y respuestas. Las preguntas pueden ser, él va a dar su conferencia en inglés, las preguntas pueden ser en español y vamos a tener por ahí dos traductores para que él este, entienda bien las, las preguntas que, van a, que ustedes realicen. Entonces, les voy a leer, a leer la reseña del profesor Shermur. Bueno, Richard Shermur es profesor de la Escuela de Planeación Urbana en la Universidad de McGill, él es economista de formación por la Universidad de Cambridge. Después de trabajar cinco años en París, Londres y Madrid, migró a Canadá en 1994, donde realizó una maestría en planeación urbana en McGill, y luego un doctorado en geografía económica en la Universidad de Montreal. En 1998, fue nombrado profesor en el Instituto Nacional de Investigación Científica en la Universidad de Quebec, donde trabajó hasta 2013, cuando se trasladó a McGill. El profesor Shermur ha publicado más de 100 artículos arbitrados y una serie de libros en tres áreas de investigación principalmente. La primera es sobre desarrollo económico urbano y regional. Ha estudiado la forma en que las economías regionales y urbanas evolucionan en situaciones en que esas economías están interconectadas y sujetas a fuerzas internas y externas. Mientras que mucho de su trabajo se ha basado en el estudio de Canadá, sus libros más recientes se ocupan de Francia en donde está trabajando con Mario Polés y Lauret Terrad. La segunda área en la cual ha publicado es la dinámica económica intrametropolitana. Estu estu estudió los procesos de localización de las actividades económicas y la forma en que la estructura interna de las áreas metropolitanas evolucionan con el tiempo. Sus estudios han, se han centrado en las ciudades canadienses y en París, y más recientemente ha comenzado a estudiar la Ciudad de México. Por último, desde finales de la década del 2000, mucho de su trabajo se ha concentrado en la innovación. Usando datos a nivel de empresa, ha investigado cómo el ambiente local dentro del cual se localiza la empresa afecta su propensión a innovar y también ha considerado cómo evolucionan las economías regionales si albergan empresas innovadoras. Esto también lo ha llevado a considerar el efecto de la creatividad en la economía local. Desde su traslado a Maquil, el profesor Shermur ha impartido cursos sobre economía urbana y la creatividad e innovaciones en la ciudad. Thanks, Richard. Mm, you have uh, one hour. Okay. You, you can start. Fine. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, buenas tardes. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí y me gustaría dar las gracias a los organizadores. Por desgracia, eso es todo mi español. <laughs> Voy seguir en inglés. So, having got that over, I will now proceed with my talk, which is about urban structure and mobility. I will try to speak relatively slowly, and I have many slides, so I hope that those of you who have some difficulty following uh, the spoken word, like I have a lot of difficulty following Spanish when I hear it, but when I see the presentations, I've managed to just about understand what people have said, so I hope this is the same for you. Um, to begin with, um, I, I just want to very briefly explain what I don't mean by urban structure. Um, there, I wrote quite a long chapter in a book which has recently come out, edited by Carlos Garrocho, where I, I, I go into a lot of depth about what urban structure is. Um, what I want to point out here is that urban structure are not patterns and shapes. I'm not interested, I, I look at, of course, patterns and shapes, but for me, that's not what an urban structure is. An urban structure is a process. Um, and processes lead to observable patterns and shapes. So as a, as a very brief example, and the metaphor probably can't be stretched too far, here is a process, okay? 
throwing a brick. Now, what are the consequences of that process? Well, an identical process, so this single process, can lead to a variety of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, patterns or of outcomes, depending on a couple of things, depending on the intention of the person throwing the brick, but also depending on the context. So, for instance, if you're standing on an empty road and throwing a brick, the consequence may just be a road full of bricks. If you're standing near a window, the consequence may well be a broken window. And if you're standing next to somebody, the consequence may be uh, rather more dramatic. All I'm trying to say is that we can look at processes and have different outcomes from identical processes, which is why I think that patterns are useful. It is, of course, useful, and very often we, we do find that uh, urban processes do lead to similar patterns, but not always. Uh, one of the examples is Los Angeles, which developed, which had no, uh, um, uh, no real existence prior to the automobile. So the introduction of the car led to a very sprawled city, whereas in cities which had a, a historic core, the automobile also led to sprawl, but didn't change the core that much. So in other words, we have different looking cities, but which actually are subject to the same processes. That's all I'll say about urban structure. I just wanted to be quite clear. Now, what am I going to talk about? To begin with, I'm going to go over a few recent ideas from sociology and geography, basically just introducing you very briefly to a few uh, thinkers who have influenced me over, uh, over the course of the last uh, five or 10 years in my thinking about geography. As you'll see, a number of these uh, writers are sociologists, and this is maybe a little parenthesis, I would invite all of you who are studying to read books which have nothing to do with your subject. Don't just do that, but please do it, because you will suddenly discover that there are lots of connections in the world of ideas between your specific topics and what are people in other disciplines looking at things from a different perspective have uh, also looked at. So I will go over some of these ideas which have influenced me, um, and then I will go uh, give a, a brief overview of urban structure as it relates to job location. I, I will mention residential location, um, which is clearly an important part of, of urban or metropolitan structure, but I'm interested in where jobs are located, and I will be quite clear about that as I go through the presentation. Then I ask a question which may seem odd, but I hope that you'll understand why I'm asking it. The question which is, is relevant now, which may not have been so relevant a few years ago, is can we actually locate where jobs occur? Is it possible to locate economic activity? And I will try to explain why I think this is a relevant question, and this is maybe the key question of the presentation. Is it possible today to locate economic activity as it, we assume it is by looking at statistics and as it has been assumed in many um, urban models uh, up till now? If I'm right, that we can't locate jobs anymore, or not easily. We can't um, uh, locate economic activities as easily today as we could in the past. Um, and you may disagree with me on this. You're quite uh, uh, free to disagree. But if I'm right, how will this affect cities? And to conclude, I will make some suggestions, some very general suggestions about what this means for policy and also what this may mean for methodology. Um, we'll get to that at the end. So. These recent ideas. The, the first uh, uh, writer, who's written uh, a lot uh, since his 2000 book, Liquid Modernity, but this is the one that I'm, um, is maybe the, the core of his thinking, is Zygmunt Baumann, who is a sociologist, uh, German of origin, I think, but who's worked for 30 years in England in Leeds. Now, I can't possibly explain to you all that he means behind these terms. But one of the things that he uh, is writing about is what he calls the move from heavy to light modernity. For him, heavy modernity is uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution where uh, uh, production was fixed to places where uh, there was relatively little mobility. There, of course, there's always been mobility. There have always been trade networks. But people were attached to place. Activities were attached to place, partly because of the sheer weight of, uh, of machines uh, um, and so on and so forth. Today he talks of light mobility, of a fluid environment where not only 
uh, uh, the, the physical attributes of, uh, of the economy and of society uh, uh, lose weight, but also uh, the, the attachment is far less uh, uh, weighty than it was before. He mentions the high divorce rates, the, the, the high mobility, people moving around. This is what he's talking about, light mobility, uh, modernity relative to heavy modernity. He specifically has a chapter, I mean, his book covers the why, you know, sociology generally, but he specifically has a chapter in this book about spaces. And he mentions that spaces um, and communities are no longer durable. They are temporary. People will move into a place and move out, will attach to a community and then move on to another community. And spaces and communities are constantly being rearranged. And he also mentions technology, and this is an important point uh, which underlies a lot of what I'm talking about. He talks about the near instantaneity of software time. And he is arguing that because of the instantaneous communications, there is a devaluation of space. Um, space as a territory, space as a place of attachment, is devalued. And in fact, now power resides no longer in controlling a territory, but in being able to move around, in being able to get out when things go bad and to follow opportunities around. So economic power and social power, according to Zygmunt Bauman, are now reside in mobility and not in immobility. All right, this is one set of ideas, and I'm, I, 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 you'll hopefully see how this links into what I'm talking about later on. The uh, second set of ideas are, uh, again, a sociologist, John Urey, who's written a lot about uh, mobility, um, mobility in a very wide sense, again, social mobility, moving up and down uh, uh, social hierarchies, uh, moving houses, uh, uh, um, uh, all the uh, var variants, really, uh, of, of the word mobility he's written about, but he has looked at spatial mobility as well. This is one of the aspects that he, he's looked at closely. Um, now, for him it's slightly different. These are not quite the same as Zygmunt Bauman. He insists on the need for physical co-presence. Um, people do need to meet face to face. So places do play a role for John Urey. Uh, unlike for Zygmunt Bauman where they don't play such a role, I don't think they're incompatible, but you need to uh, uh, read them closely um, to, to sort of work out why they're not so incompatible. The important thing here, what John Urey suggests, Face-to-face, -face, meeting people remains important. However, traveling mobility does open up what he calls novel socialities, new ways of interacting. And in particular, I'd like to point out what he says about uh, uh, um, uh, potentially uh, economic uh, activities. He talks about the business meetings taking place on the train. So these are people meeting face-to-face -face in a moving object. So basically, where is the meeting occurring? So he too is, is sort of, despite the fact that he insists on the importance of people meeting, he points out that meetings can now occur in moving objects. So where do you meet if you're in a train? The train is moving. Uh, if you have a long meeting and the train is going from Montreal to Toronto, where did the meeting occur? Did it occur in Montreal or did it occur in Toronto? Um, he also talks about using mobile technology, that now you can actually uh, uh, ha have meetings or communicate, uh, arrange meetings whilst you're walking down the street. So he too, in a different way, is pointing out that mobility is changing things. Mobility is changing the way we meet um, and changing the way, in this case, that business uh, is conducted. Now, again, I'm moving on to another, and, and these writers are not don't necessarily cite each other, are not necessarily connected anywhere else but in my own readings. André Thor is a French uh, uh, economist, more of an institutional economist, and he is a, I put him, put him here as a representative of a wider school of thought that has come out of France, which is the, the proximity school. Uh, what they uh, argue is that interactions between people no longer, or, or between uh, companies, no longer uh, uh, require physical co-location. We don't need to have two companies in the same place. What is a lot more important are, uh, is cognitive proximity, that you speak the same language, uh, the same uh, uh, conceptual language as well, no doubt, as, as the same language language, um, that uh, you have social proximities. You, it's far easier to exchange information and collaborate with people you get on well with. And geography is no longer that important. But just like John Urey, he does point out that 
meeting face to face is important. It is important to build up a shared vocabulary. It is important to build up shared uh, uh, social understanding, to get on well with people. And the title of this paper is quite self-explanatory. It's on the role played by temporary geographical proximity. For him and for the proximity school, uh, economic actors meeting each other, is, uh, it is important, we do need to meet, but these meetings can be temporary, just like us here. We're at a conference, we've all converged on the Colegio de Mexico, we are here for two days, and then we will all disperse. This is an archetypal temporary meeting, temporary co-location, which allows us to exchange ideas, um, allows us to, to see if there's people we get on well with who we would like to work with uh, in the future, and then we will all disperse. What André Thor and the Proximity School are arguing is that this is becoming more and more common. Co-location, the clustering of economic activity, is no longer that important. What is important is the capacity to meet, to intersect, and then to go on our ways. Another couple of sociologists, uh, Lee Rainey and Barry Wellman, have written a recent book about uh, uh, networking. They're, they are not economists. They, they don't really look at the economy. They explain how social networks are working. Um, and they uh, talk, uh, they have this new concept of networked individualism. Again, which I won't go into in too much depth here because I think that would take us too, uh, 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 too far off, uh, off course. But their main point is that computers and communication devices have become mobile and wireless. Um, therefore, communication, analysis, information gathering, which are all key elements of economic activity, particularly the higher order uh, uh, economic activity and the more intellectual forms of economic activity, um, they are no longer tied to place. Now, I'm the one saying that. What they point out is that communication, analysis, information gathering can now happen anywhere where you can link your iPhone onto the network. But what I'm then saying, well, is that therefore they're not tied to a particular place. An expression that I love in their book is they, they talk about the new choreography of physical gatherings. It's as if people were dancers, like André Thor suggests, like John Urey suggests. Everybody's moving around, and from time to time you intersect, you meet, you exchange, and then you move around again. They're describing social networks. They're describing uh, students meeting up for beers. Uh, they're not describing business people. But I think this new choreography of physical gatherings is increasingly important in the economy as well as uh, in the social networks that they describe. Now, finally, a geographer, a very uh, uh, respected and well-known geography, Doreen Massey, who wrote a great book in 2005 called For Space. And in this book, this book has inspired me a lot. And in fact, I read this book first. And then as I read the other sociology literature, I realized how what she is saying is backed up by a lot of the sociology uh, and, and some of the economic work out there. For her, places are not containers. Places do not really have fixed attributes. They don't contain things. Rather, a place is where trajectories, where moving bodies, and, and we are moving bodies, where we intersect. And we are, as I said, we are now intersecting temporarily, and our trajectories after today will lead us on to other places. And a place is where trajectories can intersect. The boundaries of a place are therefore blurred uh, and uncertain. You know, where exactly is this meeting occurring? Is it in this room? Is it in the colegio? Do we include the hotels? Do we include the restaurants where we're going to have lunch, uh, meals together? The place is very difficult to identify. What, what we can identify are the fact that for a period our trajectories are intersecting. The other important point she makes is that each person in a particular place, and, and, and you know, it, 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 however you choose to define place, each person in that place has not only their current presence, but has all their other networks. Everywhere we have been in the past has an effect on where we are now. And this is the importance also of thinking about trajectories. Is that, and this is one of the, the errors, I think, which is made when people associate, for example, innovation with cities. Um, I wrote a paper about that recently, where the problem is you take a city and you say, ah, there's some innovation occurring there, therefore the innovation comes from the city. But you have no idea of where the innovators have come from, what has influenced the innovators, and therefore it's very difficult to attribute the innovative process 
to a particular place. And this is an argument that I've developed um, elsewhere. And uh, again, a lot of my thinking uh, that I'm describing to you today has come from my work on innovation and the knowledge flows and where the knowledge and information comes from when you are innovating. And it very rarely, almost never, comes from a single place. Therefore, I'm not quite sure you can attribute an innovation process to a particular place or a particular type of place, even. So those are some very broad ideas. We haven't really talked about cities yet, but I've tried to introduce you to some of the, uh, the thinking behind um, uh, uh, the ideas I'll be uh, uh, discussing now. So I, I say I, I will now quickly go over some ideas, some rather traditional ideas about urban structure. The point being to bring you up to speed so that when I then say, well, actually, it may not work like this anymore, you can see where I'm coming from. So urban structure, what is it? I often look at where activities, uh, economic activities take place, but there are at least two other, uh, uh, um, I mean, there are many, uh, structure can mean political structure, can mean uh, social structure, but from a geographic perspective, when we talk about urban structure, there are at least three different uh, 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 things that we look at. We, we look at where people live, uh, let's say we look at neighborhoods, um, Sociologists often do that. We look at where act, uh, economic activities take place. People like myself have done a lot of work uh, on that. And there's also a, a group of people, planners, cultural geographers, who look at where social interactions uh, occur. Um, and I would say, you know, you have the social interactions are linked to public places, places of sociality, economic activities linked to you know, uh, buildings and uh, neighborhoods where um, companies locate and neighborhoods where people live. I admit there are probably many other uh, things to look at in the city, but you've covered, we've covered quite a broad range of topics under these three uh, headings. So, as I said, urban sociologists look at where people live, they look at residential areas, neighborhoods, commuting. Economic geographers, people like myself, look at where people work. We look at the central business district, we look at employment subcenters, we look at commuting, how people get to where they work. And an increasingly important item, um, which uh, we'll be returning to, are spaces of consumption, where entertainment occurs, where uh, purchases are made. Um, these uh, cultural activities occur in spaces of, uh, of consumption, entertainment districts, and I think that we can separate those off. They are not purely economic, and they are not purely, uh, they're not residential. This is another type of activity that cities are, are, uh, is very important in cities. And in fact, one could almost say that if you think of the Greek agora, and you think of the marketplace uh, in medieval towns, uh, or the zucalos, if you like, in, uh, in uh, um, Mexican cities, um, places of sociality and of consumption, increasingly, uh, um, almost define what a city is. And we'll come back to that idea a bit later on. Now, all these studies have one thing in common. They have usually assumed that there exist fixed places Fixed places where people live, these are neighborhoods, homes, so there's fixed buildings, fixed neighborhoods where people live. And to be quite frank, I think that's still the case. I'm not claiming that people move, I mean, people do move. We had a very interesting paper yesterday about mobility within metropolitan areas, but mobility occurs over a period of years. People move slowly. They don't just move in and out, you know, uh, um, temporarily. Um, where people work, and there's a lot of work has been done on the clustering of economic activities, on the workplace, on employment subcenters, on the polycentricity of, of cities, uh, polycentric urban uh, um, economic uh, centers, if you will. And where people socialize, there are entertainment districts, there are parks where people converge. All these are fixed places, okay? Now, between these fixed places, we then have transport networks. So, of course, mobility has always been part of how we study cities. The main reason for looking at mobility is we have all these fixed places and people are moving between these fixed places. Uh, different period periodicities, uh, different times of, of day or night, but there is uh, mobility between these fixed places. And fixed places have always been considered to be very important because people know who will be there and they know approximately the times of day people will be there. So in other words, if I'm sitting in my office at McGill, people know or used to know that I would be there and they would come along 
and, uh, uh, and visit me during my office hours. Uh, in the same way, if you wanted to go out on a Saturday evening, there'd be the entertainment district, you'd go down there and your friends would uh, be there. Um, the argument put forward for economic clustering is that this allows the exchange of information, uh, collaborations, and so on and so forth. If you're all in a fixed place, so we are told, this will enable or facilitate collaboration, exchange of ideas, and so on and so forth. Now, you can already see that the ideas that I presented earlier on are beginning to question whether this is the case, but traditionally, I would say, these are the assumptions which have been made and which are still often made when we think about cities. Now, some, those of you who have read the chapter in the book by Carlos Garocha will recognize this figure. This is one, uh, and, and it's a very classic figure, of the uh, Chicago School uh, uh, um, model or, or conceptualization of the city. Now, what is important is that each of those concentric rings has a particular function, and the, uh, uh, the central business district is called the central business district because that is where key businesses locate. Then you have a second ring, uh, where you have the, the manufacturing uh, activities, and then you have various residential areas coming out. All these are fixed places. Underlying this model are fixed places, fixed places of residence, fixed places of work, and they interact. And of course, William Alonso, who, inspired by this concentric model, then uh, uh, made it into more of an of a econometric uh, uh, model, um, is basically uh, uh, um, showing how people or, or the trade-off between a fixed place of residence and a fixed place of work and the time of transport. William Alonso assumes fixed places of residence, fixed places of work. Hoyt, who took that model and modified it slightly, so we, we, uh, we move away from the concentric rings, we now have a, a path dependency, uh, we have economic activities that locate in a particular place, and as these activities grow, they will grow out along particular axes. But we still have fixed places of work, fixed places of residence. So the shape is, 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 is a bit different, but the idea that we are still talking about fixed places is very much in this uh, view of things. Harrison Ullman came along in the mid-40s, because don't think that polycentric cities are a recent phenomenon. Harrison Ullman uh, quite clearly described polycentricity in their 1945 paper. But there too, there are centers, there are clusters, fixed clusters in space, where people travel to in the morning to work and then they leave in the evening. So we still are talking about fixed places. And more recently, things have distended along highways. Um, the current view of polycentricity is slightly different because unlike Harris and Ullman, there is this idea that maybe some key strategic services are now moving out to uh, uh, um, suburban centers, but we still assume that these, play, uh, these uh, economic activities locate in fixed places, which maybe stretch out along highways uh, that would be the, the, the um, scattering approach uh, which uh, Robert Lang describes in his uh, um, 2003 paper on edgeless cities. His edgeless cities may be edgeless, but there's a definite location logic to them along transport um, networks. So th these are the ideas. And I would say that th this last one, where you, you integrate uh, uh, suburban edge cities and transport uh, networks, um, certainly from the papers that, that, that I have been reading recently, is still very much the conceptual framework which is used to study metropolitan areas. We are still assuming fixed places of residence, which is fine, but also fixed places of work, which I am less uh, happy with. Why am I less happy with this? Because I think it's a very legitimate question today, is can we actually locate where economic activity happens? Okay. Now, typically, when we study the location of economic activity, we look at firms, you know, where do uh, um, uh, employers locate, where do companies locate, um, or we look at where individuals work. Um, this is more or less the same thing, but the point of entry is different. We can enter via the um, uh, economic organization, or we can enter via the individual. Now, bearing in mind those wider ideas that I, uh, I discussed, I think it's increasingly difficult to um, pinpoint exactly 
where economic activity locates. And th there are a couple of, of, of reasons. If we are looking at the firms, at companies, you have to realize that the way that many companies are organizing, and I'm mainly talking about service uh, companies here, of course, uh, and, and we, we will go on later you know, uh, um, uh, to, to, to discuss this in a bit more detail. Um, the way that firms are organizing is evolving. Now, there has always been a problem, even in the more classic studies, a problem which has usually just been ignored, that there has always been a mobile workforce. There have always been construction workers, there have always been salespeople, there have always been transport sectors. So there is a category of workers who we have never really been able to assign a location to. And this is very important to remember, that the assumption underlying fixed places of work is clearly has never been uh, uh, um, uh, completely justified. We have uh, 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 reasoned that the proportion of construction workers, of salespeople, of people working in transport has been sufficiently small for us to uh, uh, ignore them. But actually, what we have tended to do with uh, the mobile workforce is assign the place of work in our analysis to where the companies are headquartered. Therefore, when I've been studying uh, um, the economy of Montreal, we always find there are lots of construction workers in a northern suburb. Okay? This, that's where construction companies locate. But if you actually go to that suburb, all you see are empty lots with piles of bricks. Obviously, the construction workers are not doing their construction year in, year out for 20 years in the same suburb. What they do is they go there to pick up their materials, and that's where the company is headquartered, and they drive out across Montreal and they build buildings. So the construction workers are not actually working where the company is headquartered. The same for transport. In, in, in transport industries, much of the work is done by mobile personnel, but they are assigned a, uh, a work location uh, uh, you know, wh wh where their companies are headquartered. And I could go on. So we've always had a bit of trouble, but as is often the case in academic work, when there's a, little, a, a, a marginal thing like this, we ignore it. More recently, there are some other uh, uh, changes which are, are occurring. Uh, one of them, which we can see more and more in uh, um, uh, sort of the, the high order business services, is what's called hot desking. The, these are companies which actually are, uh, ha have an official address or headquarters, usually in quite a prestigious building or, or at a good address downtown. Um, but there are very few offices there because actually people are working on their mobile computers uh, or on their mobile phones and will only come into the office once in a while for a meeting, to meet a client, maybe a couple of times a week to discuss things with their director. But actually, everybody is using uh, uh, um, uh, a small number of places uh, because actually where their work is happening is either at home, they could be working at home, they could be working on the road, uh, they, they're, they're not necessarily working in their, their office. Which brings me to the other phenomenon, telecommuting. Now, telecommuting, many people will say, oh, come on, you know, studies have been done about telecommuting in, in the 90s and the early 2000s. It's a fairly marginal phenomenon. Why bring it up now? I, I think we need to think very carefully about the impact of communication technologies on cities and on behavior. What we have seen, many of you are maybe too young to remember the mid-90s, when there was no such thing as mobile phones. Well, if there were, they were about this size, okay, and, and very heavy. Um, there was certainly no such thing as Wi-Fi. It was beginning, you know, in, in, uh, but there was really no, no, no Wi-Fi. The World Wide Web really, I think, came online. There was internet before, but the World Wide Web came online in 94. Now, between 94 and 2004, over the next 10 years, these technologies became ubiquitous. People began to trust them. Uh, people began to use them. In particular, uh, uh, in the economy, companies began to see not only that they could use them, but began to understand how they could be used, and also began to see that these were reliable technologies. So it's only in the last five, seven years that economic actors have truly begun to make decisions based upon these new communication technologies. And this I've noticed in my work on... In, on, on um, uh, innovation on the one hand and also in long-distance commuting on the other. 
Uh, what I've noticed on uh, my, my work on innovation is that um, back in the 90s, there used to be a, a quite a clear uh, um, degradation of the capacity to innovate as one moved away from cities. But over 15 years, up to about 2005, that changed. And now companies across the whole of the territory, whether they're in cities or uh, a long way off, now they, they, they have no trouble accessing information. They, they can now locate in fairly remote places if they choose to. And, they, and I, again, this is another area of research which I won't go into in too much detail. Suffice it to say that companies now seem to be making location decisions and making business and strategic decisions based on communication technologies which they weren't making 10 or 15 years ago. The same is true of telecommuting. Around Canadian cities, we see that there is a band of uh, rural, uh, neighbor, um, neighborhood, rural municipalities about an hour to two hours drive away from Montreal or Toronto or Vancouver where we see a growing number of professionals locating. Now, those professionals actually declare a place of work in Vancouver, in Montreal, or in Toronto, but they declare a place of residence about 150 or 200 kilometers away. It's because these professionals are beginning to take advantage of the reality of uh, uh, robust telecommunications networks, which allow them to work two or three days a week in a nice uh, uh, Canadian uh, countryside, um, rather than being located all the time uh, in the city. Now, this is not a mass phenomenon, but we are talking about noticeable patterns which emerge when we look at place of residence and place of work. And the only explanation for these patterns is that these professionals are choosing to telecommute, telecommute no doubt, and this is why it's important, this 150 to 200 kilometers. You can drive up to the city in an hour or two, so you can have your face-to-face -face contacts, you can do your hot desking a couple of uh, days a week, but you don't have to be there all the time. So when you are then thinking, looking at place of work uh, statistics, you say, oh, we have a lot of professionals working in downtown Montreal, but when you see where they're living, you say, well, they can't possibly be working there every day. They have to be telecommuting and or, or there, there is mobility involved. They no doubt come to, this, to uh, the centre of Montreal occasionally, but that's not where they're doing all their work. So I think telecommuting, quite rightly, I think that the studies of telecommuting and indeed of innovation showed very little effective technologies up to about the mid-2000s. But I think behaviour is beginning to change because now these are robust and they, they are pervasive technologies, whereas up until about nine or ten years ago, we couldn't have said that they were robust and pervasive. And it's only once they become robust and pervasive that people will begin to make decisions, strategic decisions, based upon these technologies. So, we talked about uh, uh, telecommuting and so on and so forth, but within the city we also find that things are changing. Work is performed, and this I'm sure that this is true for you, it's true for me. We may have an office in a university or in a place, but actually where we are physically doing our work, doing our thinking, gathering our information, can be in a cafe, can be on the train, can be in a park, can be at home, uh, can be in someone else's office. We may have a meeting somewhere and say, oh, hang on, can you just give me a, 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 a bit of desk? I want to work for a couple of hours before going home. Can be at the hotel. And very occasionally, we actually go to our, our own office to do some work. So again, when we're thinking in, in our own lives, where does our work actually occur? Where, does our, where are we producing value? Actually, not much of the value we're producing is done in the office. In my case, I'm not in my McGill office today. I hope I'm producing a bit of value. I'm certainly not producing it in Montreal. Um, and the same goes for all of us as we move around the city. And even on a day-to-day -day basis, if we're fed up with our department, we go out and open up our computer in a Starbucks or wherever we want. So where we are actually working is not where our address or job is, is, is assigned. Now, some of you may have been thinking, now hang on, th this is not true for all jobs. You know, you're talking about professors, you're talking about students, you're talking about high-end consultants. Yes, I, I do realize that this is a marginal phenomenon for now. Um, and I think that this is why when we think about jobs, we need to seriously begin to think about their attachment to fixed places. 
I'm suggesting here uh, that th 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 there's no absolute reason why it should be three categories, and there may be other categories too, but my suggestion, at least today, is that we can categorize jobs from a geographic perspective into three categories. The first category are immobile jobs. Now, what I haven't mentioned uh, um, here, what I have, is manufacturing. So what we have is two different types of, of, of jobs. We have, on the one hand, service jobs. The hairdressing, the restaurants, the entertainment, the government offices where people go to pick up information uh, or, or, or receive services. These are service jobs which require face-to-face -face interaction. They yet, haven't yet invented a way of cutting hair over the telephone. And they haven't yet invented a way of sending your meal over the internet. We have to meet the service providers in order to obtain the service. And these jobs are immobile. You cannot, if you are working in a restaurant, you have to go to that restaurant every day. If you are working in a hairdresser salon, it's very difficult to avoid going to cut hair in that salon. Although, of course, you may have a mobile hairdresser who, who, who goes around, and this may actually be occurring. We may even find that some of these face-to-face -face services are occurring in people's homes now, rather than in hairdressing salons, for instance. The other type of job, which is immobile, I've mentioned manufacturing here, but also agriculture. Uh, these are uh, uh, jobs which are left over from Zygmunt Bauman's heavy modernity. We still have factories which have heavy equipment. You need people to run the equipment. Fewer and fewer people, certainly in North America and Europe, a lot of processes are being automated, but you still need some people to go and supervise this uh, equipment or um, you know, move things around in the factories. So these also would be immobile jobs. Now, the second set of jobs are what I call semi-mobile jobs. And those are the jobs which actually caused problem, have always caused problem uh, in, in um, the, the analysis of job location. Um, these are jobs where people do move around. I mean, your construction worker will work for a few weeks or a few months in one place, and then will go to another building site and another building site, but you sort of know where they are. They, they don't have the freedom in the middle of the day to say, I don't want to work on this building site, I'm going to go to the next building site. They do have uh, periodicity to their movement around the town. The same thing for bus drivers. Yes, they are mobile, but they are mobile on a very fixed network. They don't have personal flexibility. They don't control their mobility. Their mobility is fixed to a network. Uh, um, the, um, the home cleaning, which is a bit like the hairdressing idea, where you, you, you move around, but you don't have the freedom. And I think that this, this idea of having the freedom to work where you want has to be distinguished from the jobs where you have to move around. Which brings us back to one of the themes which I didn't mention in Sigmund Bauman and uh, John Urey. Or I, maybe I mentioned it, yeah, I did mention it when I was talking about John Urey. Is the fact that mobility is associated with economic and social power. So these semi-mobile jobs, even if some of the people are moving around, these are not jobs which have much power. They cannot decide to go and work in a cafe or decide to take a plane to Mexico because they've been invited. They are very constrained in their mobility. But they are not at a fixed location. And finally, you have the mobile jobs, which are the ones that I've been talking about, which are more associated with, I hate to use this term, but this is a shorthand term, the creative classes of Richard Florida, if you will, the high order service occupations, um, where there is a lot of choice, a, a lot of personal uh, uh, freedom involved, and these technologies are uh, freeing uh, the, the location of where uh, uh, the jobs are actually performed. Now. I mentioned these three sorts of jobs. You have the immobile, the semi-mobile, and the mobile. But even the most mobile of workers is attached to a particular place. I mean, however much I travel and want to work in cafes, from time to time, I do need to show up at my office, OK? Um, believe it or not. So you actually have almost a, 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 a hierarchy, if you will, where you have the fixed locations, and these are jobs or, 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 or parts of a job. Maybe we should even think about uh, um, functions, um, employment functions which are attached to place. And some jobs have many functions which are uh, immobile. Then you have the uh, um, jobs which are semi-mobile, but they also have some fixed aspects. Even if you're a truck driver, from time to time you go to your headquarters, and then from time to time you, you uh, move around. And even 
university professors, consultants, and all that, we have some fixed portions of our jobs. When we're teaching, we have to be in front of our class. Uh, when we're in departmental meetings, we have to be at the meetings. But a lot of the rest of the time, we have that freedom I've been describing. As an aside, and I won't go into this in much detail, the same is also true, and this is the uh, uh, Barry and Wellman book, of socializing and consumption. Uh, the social meetings, just like work meetings, can also be arranged uh, over the mobile phones. So basically, we can arrange to meet people at the last minute. Um, we can decide, hey, we're going to have a party, but not in the entertainment district. We're going some, somewhere else. All this is, it means that the socializing and consumption can also be freed, from, to, uh, at least uh, um, to some extent, from the uh, fixed spaces. But there still are points which remain fixed for consumption and socializing. But I, that's not my area of expertise, and I won't go into that in too much detail. Just to point out, though, that I'm focusing on the, the, the fact that there, are, there is a class of uh, um, uh, economic um, functions or, or employment functions which are, are mobile. It's also true for consumption and entertainment. So how will this affect cities? Well. We can't assume that dense employment centers are necessary for all types of activity. There is this idea that employment will tend to cluster, that we have employment centers, um, and particularly for higher knowledge content uh, um, uh, sort of activities. I don't think we can uh, any longer assume that this clustering is necessary. And in fact, some of my recent work uh, shows that you can be very innovative in a cluster, but also equally innovative outside a cluster. So you're not, not innovative when you're in a cluster, but it's not a condition of, of uh, being innovative. And I think this goes along this idea, you know, what role do these employment centers, particularly for high knowledge contents uh, activities, play? However, there are clusters which will remain, even though Socializing and entertainment can be coordinated uh, in the choreography uh, described by Barry and Wellman. Um, there are still places where people travel for personal services, for retail, and for entertainment. And the people who work in these places have to go to these centers, and also uh, people who want to consume uh, from these spaces also need to travel to these fixed places. Centers play a key role for face-to-face -face meetings. So even if I'm a consultant and most of my time I'm working from home, from time to time I need to meet clients and where will I meet them? I will meet them where there's a cafe, where there's a restaurant, where uh, there are meeting places. So the, the role of urban sub-centers is probably more one of entertainment and meeting than one of actually pro producing, whether it's our services, uh, or at least intellectual services, or, uh, um, or manufacturing for that matter. I think the key role of urban centers now is increasingly meetings and entertainment. Now, you could argue, well, there's still a lot of high order services happening in the CBD, and I would agree. I would say that one of the key things about the central business district that one tends to forget is the symbolic value. You know, if you are a big company, you want to show that you can afford a downtown uh, address. Um, the argument that you need that downtown address to coordinate things, I'm not sure it's as valid now as it was. It may still have some validity, but you definitely still have the prestige attached to a, a CBD address. However, a number of companies like uh, Microsoft in Seattle have decided to move out of, they're not, not in downtown Seattle, they're in an edge city. Um, and there are a lot of suburban campuses of large companies. So actually, the prestige of the CBD is still there. I'm not denying it. But there are, there are examples where that prestige is not considered necessary. So the question then is, what role do employment centers play uh, for the information and uh, knowledge exchange? And are they still important, particularly for high order services and high knowledge content? So these are questions. I don't have the answer to these. But these are questions which arise uh, because of the thinking that I've suggested before. Now, it also means from a student's perspective or researcher's perspective, it is increasingly difficult to decipher the spatial structure of a city's economy. When we observe patterns, what are we observing? We're just observing the addresses where people say that their company headquarters are usually. But that's not really where people are necessarily producing their ideas or producing the, 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 their economic activity. So we need to distinguish between where a job is recorded and where it is actually performed. And as I've just mentioned, it is actually performed in a whole variety of places. 
uh, not just where it's recorded. And for those of you doing statistical analysis, it means that what, what does it mean when we have figures which tell us about job location? Um, they are, I think, increasingly difficult to interpret, particularly in the high knowledge uh, industries. What's left, I mean, we can still observe very clearly urban structures, but what's left are, will be the urban structures which are connected with consumption, with entertainment, with meeting places, and of course, with manufacturing industries, but which at least in, the, in, in the, uh, North American and European towns are increasingly out in the suburbs or in medium-sized cities. We find fewer and fewer manufacturing activities in our largest um, cities. So what remains in our large cities, we do have meeting places, we do have focal points, but they are far more meeting places and uh, places of consumption and entertainment than places of production. And those of you who see parallels between what I'm saying here and the consumer city, you know, the Terry Clark ideas about the uh, um, uh, consumption in the city, you're quite right. What I'm saying here seems to be going along those lines, but from a, a different perspective. This also means, I've just described how we can get information from everywhere, how we can communicate. We don't necessarily have to communicate with people locally, which means that outside factors are increasingly important. If I need to communicate with a colleague in, uh, in England, I can send him an email from my cafe and he will get or she will get back to me. Um, I can send them a document which they can, uh, can look at. I can telephone them if I need to speak to them. So provided I have social proximity or cognitive proximity with my interlocutors, I don't even need to be in the same city of them. I and many other knowledge workers are very much influenced by the outside and it is less and less obvious that we are influenced by uh, our immediate surroundings in the realm of ideas and um, creation. Um, conversely, whatever ideas individuals who live in a city have can actually be exploited elsewhere. So we may have an a city which is generating many ideas and, 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 and many new types of information, but that information may actually be being used by people elsewhere. Um, so what's happening, what I'm describing, uh, the, 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 these uh, processes which I'm describing, which I think are changing how we look at the intra-metropolitan economy, also I think should change how we look at metropolitan economies writ large. Um, and my work on innovation has been more at this scale than at the um, intermetropolitan scale, although I have now begun looking at the intermetropolitan scale. But it does mean we have to start thinking about cities as places where uh, connections are made, where interconnections are possible, where face-to-face -face meetings can occur temporarily, but no longer as fixed places. This is liquid modernity, or liquid cities, if you will, um, you know, uh, uh, borrowing from Zygmunt Bauman's um, ideas. So, this points to a new way of thinking about the spatiality of a city's economy. So, this is where we were at the end of what I would call the classic period, where we still believed in fixed uh, uh, job locations. Now, you still have the transport network, but the, the actual location of, of, of things is very difficult. We, we don't know where things are anymore. In, in this view of things, we have locations, we have centers, and this is where economic activity occurs. Here we don't know really where economic activity occurs, but we know that in some particular places, people meet and trajectories intersect. So we now have points where at particular points in time, trajectories cross, okay? And it's this intersection of trajectories, which is also time dependent, okay? This is a trajectory which, at two different points in time, is in one place and then in another. And in fact, most of these trajectories which I've drawn as straight lines are in fact zigzags. So you can have somebody who is uh, in, in, um, you know, in, in this point meeting place in the morning and is in that meeting place in the afternoon. So we would say, ah, you know, it, um, th th these meeting places uh, uh, are important, they are there, but their constitution has changed during the course of the day or maybe during the course of the week. Um, the, the, the temporality of all these changes is something to think about, but this, I think, is uh, uh, um, when I'm saying that we need to think about these, the, 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 these centers now 
uh, where, where headquarters are recorded, because headquarters are probably still recorded in these places, but these are places where people's trajectories intersect temporarily, and then they move on elsewhere. Where the value is actually created, where the reports are being written, where the uh, research is being done, actually, we're not quite sure. All we can be sure of now is where it is that people meet at particular times. Now, this may remind you of uh, the Hagerstrand sort of time uh, geography, and, and it, it is related to that, but there's one important difference. Hagerstrand had fixed places. His time geography is people moving during the day between fixed places. Here, the places aren't even fixed. Why aren't they fixed? Because people all have their mobile technology, and you can change meeting places during the course of the day. If you arrange to meet two people at point A, and you can't make it, you can pick up your phone, say, can we change the meeting place? Either you can or you can't. But even the meeting places are no longer fixed. They can change during the day. This is obviously something that Hagerstrand couldn't uh, incorporate in, in his study. I think they're still very relevant. Um, but we need to think how we can adapt Hagerstrand to this, uh, uh, you know, to the flexibility um, which these uh, new communication and these mobile communication technologies allow. So, this is, in a way, another way of saying the same thing, where you have employment locations which are increasingly difficult to identify, but in the background you have all those spots. And those spots are where we don't know where economic activity is. So this is, in a way, a field of possibilities. All the spots are where people are doing their work. And we just don't know where they're doing their work. What we do know is that uh, you know, they're sort of meeting around the transport networks. And the airport is, is an important one. Those of you who, uh, there, there's that book about um, Aeropolis, I can't remember the, 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 the author, um, uh, Marcel Auger wrote about uh, airports as well. The, the places of passage are being theorized now uh, increasingly. And I think when you're thinking about the location of economic activity, where value is, is created, particularly in the knowledge economy, um, you get this sort of picture. You just get a field of possibilities. We're not really quite sure where it's happening. So what does this mean for urban policy? Well, one thing you need to be very careful about is that even though I'm talking about change, because that's obviously more interesting than talking about things that don't change, cities change very slowly. And what city managers need to do also changes very slowly. So yes, we have to be aware of these new ideas and these new possibilities, these new ways of behaving, but we mustn't forget that there is a huge amount of inertia of the built environment, but also of what cities can do and what they should do. Um, urban services. It's not because we have mobile workplaces that we should forget to collect the refuse, that we should forget to manage the public spaces, that we should forget the management of land use, and whatever other normal services municipalities provide still need to be provided and are still at the basis, I think, of urban uh, activity. Infrastructure, of course, we need to make sure the infrastructure is properly maintained. This is an example of a road in Montreal. We have many potholes in Montreal. Um, we need to have infrastructure. We don't may necessarily need to have tons of it, but we need to have infrastructure we can rely on and which is sufficient. Very important in infrastructure. More is not always better, but there is a threshold, and if you fall below that infrastructure threshold, you then begin to have problems. So municipalities need to look after their infrastructure. Very basic. Not very attractive. Uh, policymakers don't like to be reminded that this is the core of urban policy. And transport. People need to get around. I've been talking about mobility. We, people still need to get around. Uh, maybe even more so today than they used to. Urban transport is, is, uh, is obviously key. Again, no secrets. The basics of urban policy won't change because of anything that I've said or any of these new trends. Whatever changes will occur are at the margins. But the margins are important because, you know, this, this is where change is occurring and we, we need to be attentive to the margins, even though fundamentally there will be no revolutionary change from anything that I've described between today and tomorrow or even between today and next year. So, planning and transport management, it does have some implications. How do you plan? How do you zone, in particular, in a mobile world? I've just described a city where basically we don't know where economic activity is occurring. So to have places which are zoned for economic activity and others for residential, for instance, makes less and less sense when you know that many people are working in their homes. So 
I'm not saying that zoning is no longer important, but you need to think about what you're zoning and the content of the zoning regulations, and also to make sure you don't inhibit some of these new possibilities which are opening up. Transport is going to be increasingly difficult, and we can already see that, to understand when and where congestion will occur. It used to be between 8 and 9 in the morning, and between 6 and 7 in the evening, you knew those were the peak times. Now it's not so simple. Uh, you, you're not quite sure when the peak times are, and you're not even quite sure where the peaks are going to occur. Um, and I think that this is, uh, and we, we're already seeing this in transport, but I think that this is something else which is partly a consequence of uh, um, some of the trends I've been describing. The other thing, I've described these meeting places. One of the things to think about is to what extent will these meeting places be constrained by existing transport networks, or to what extent will transport networks need to adapt to new meeting places. Again, I have no answer to this, but I think this is something we need to, uh, to, to think about. To what extent should uh, infrastructure and transport networks be adaptive to these new trends, or to what extent they say, well, this is what we're offering, and you can organize yourselves bearing in mind what we're offering. Never forget that agents are adaptive. So, uh, you know, municipalities don't necessarily need to, to change things, they just need to, you know, it's the agents who will change the way that they use what's offered to them. But there is this causality, you know, it, what is the direction of causality when you are planning uh, transport networks and, and infrastructure. Another issue which is, uh, um, uh, I think, becomes more acute, this is an issue which has been around for some time, but is more acute now with this importance of people moving around, is the privatization of public space. There's many, uh, much has been written about the way that um, uh, public space is being uh, privatized. Shopping centers are being privately managed. Many town centers in Great Britain are being taken over and managed by private organizations or by, uh, as business improvement districts. Um, now, if it's really important, if it becomes crucial for the integration of individuals to be able to get to these meetings and to move around during the day, and if there are some spaces which are out of bounds or difficult to access, then um, the, the problems associated with the privatization of public space could become more acute if it's true indeed that this, uh, these last minute uh, uh, meetings, this last minute socialization, this flexibility is the way that things are going, then people need to be able to access meeting places, shopping centers, cafes, restaurants, where work or, and, or uh, leisure is occurring. As these places become privatized and who has access and who doesn't becomes uh, more acute in the light of what I've been describing, it's already a problem even without what I've been describing, but I think that this exacerbates it. One of the, the things, it's not so much a policy uh, idea, although to some extent it is, is when you think about what the role of a city is and what the role of places within the city are, one could argue that cities are actually reverting to their primary role. Uh, Cities as meeting place. Uh, this uh, pictogram is the Aboriginal pictogram for meeting place. It looks very much like the concentric model with interconnecting trajectories. It's a, uh, and, and this is uh, you know, a traditional Aboriginal um, depiction of the meeting place. So cities, as I've been describing them, and places within the cities are meeting places and they're marketplaces. The market for entertainment, spaces of consumption, these are very traditional roles of the city which have been around at least since the Middle Ages, uh, no doubt uh, uh, prior to that. Production within the city is a more recent phenomenon. Uh, production used to take place in the countryside. It entered the city during the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and it's only in the last 200 years or so that production has entered uh, uh, the city. Is production, uh, already we can see this quite clearly in, 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 uh, in, 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 in North American cities, production, as I mentioned to you earlier, is occurring on the fringes or in medium or smaller uh, cities, if it's occurring in North America at all, that is. Um, and maybe the association between production and the city is now becoming less uh, important, and even the, even the production of services um, what's important is the city as a meeting place uh, and as a, a market for certain forms of consumption. And then there are environmental concerns. We've talked a lot about uh, mobility. Um, what impact will this have on, on travel behavior, on emissions, and so on and so forth? Well, I think it's indeterminate for the time being. Um, it could actually increase 
travel, it could increase uh, 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 emissions, uh, increase congestion as well, uh, if people are moving more. But also, it may decrease uh, uh, um, environmental impacts if there is some substitution between uh, communications and physical mobility. The jury is out. A number of people have tried to look at that, and I think things are changing fast. So whatever studies are done today may not be relevant in five years' time. I think we need to keep an eye on this. And as we're thinking about policies, to what extent can we push the decrease potential of these, this intercommunication uh, um, um, and the, 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 the sort of, uh, this capacity now to work in different places to meet temporarily rather than uh, to push uh, to, towards the increases. Um, and, and maybe, of course, we're, uh, there's outside shocks such as uh, if there's a huge increase in the cost of, uh, uh, of gas, well, of course, that will have um, uh, another uh, unpredictable effect. One thing I don't think is a very good idea, which I hear mentioned a lot in planning circles, is this idea of trying to build small neighborhoods in city where there's a work residence balance. Why don't I think it's a good idea? I've just explained that one of the key attributes now, particularly of high knowledge work, is the capacity to move around. So of course you're never going to be able to get people to work and live in the same place. In fact, that almost negates the very uh, nature of what a metropolitan area is. A metropolitan area is somewhere where people have multiple meeting places, where they can move around, uh, where people will come to the airport for you to meet them and so on and so forth. So you're not going to be working next to your home all the time. And this idea that you can have a work residence balance is premised on the idea that there are fixed workplaces. Well, if workplaces are no longer fixed, then the very idea of local neighborhoods with a balance is, uh, just doesn't make sense. So uh, I'm sure that may, some people may disagree with me. I don't think this idea works in the metropolitan area. Otherwise, what you're doing is just creating a whole bunch of villages, in which case you're no longer a metropolitan area. So to conclude, all this does tie in to the wider social changes which I described uh, in, in the beginning. And I think you need to remember this, that although I've tried to focus in on the implications for job location in urban areas, the reason that I'm looking at that are these wider changes. Um, there's an increasing overlap between work and play. This is something which many sociologists have noticed. You know, people can't switch off. They're working at home on the internet, and uh, during the day they are partly doing leisure, partly doing uh, work. This interpenetration of work and leisure, which in fact, the separation is a historical aberration. Um, again, those of you who've studied middle age uh, uh, cities during the uh, um, Middle Ages will know that craftsmen worked above, uh, lived above their workplaces. Um, farmers lived in their farms. This idea that you have a separate place of work is actually a fairly recent phenomenon, and we may actually be reverting back to something which uh, has characterized cities for far longer than we suspect. Another thing to which I've mentioned uh, is the status associated with mobile jobs. Uh, we talk about the uh, um, uh, polarization, social polarization. Well, the capacity to mobilize space in the way I've described is a, a capacity which is associated with higher social status. So is this mobility another way of separating out the higher social status from the lower social statuses, which is what John Urey and Zygmunt Bauman are suggesting. And again, so within urban areas, is this mobility really another sign of polarization? Um, we know that economic structures, again, particularly in European and North American cities, but I'm pretty sure in, in um, large cities in Mexico too, is moving towards high uh, order services, is moving towards uh, symbolic uh, and cultural uh, uh, value, um, partly because um, actual hands-on production is diminishing because of automation. So now value where people are, um, the, the areas where people are working are these more uh, symbolic, cultural, or knowledge uh, areas. Um, so there is a, 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 industrial, a shift in industrial structure which may accelerate some of the processes which I've been describing. And all this ties in with the new concepts of space which Doreen Massey described. And indeed, my little uh, map with all those arrows is very much uh, premised on Doreen Massey's view of things. Her view is a lot more subtle than what I presented here. I don't have time to go into all the details, but basically I, I do find that she's very uh, useful in helping us to think through these things. 
A final point, because I know I'm talking to students and researchers, is the methodology. So I've been through all of this. What does this mean methodologically? It means we need to really ask questions about employment location statistics. What are we looking at when we look at employment location? Uh, you need to ask these questions. Uh, you may also, or one may, also need to do increasing survey work or qualitati qualitative work to begin to understand, to be, begin to unpack some of the ideas. I am not sure that statistics uh, um, centrally gathered will get very far in unpacking what I've been describing. We also have to be prepared to conceive of space or geography in a new way. Cities are not containers are not uh, of economic activity or, or indeed of much other activity. Um, cities are focal points where, where trajectories can intersect, as I've said, and this is a new way or different way of thinking about uh, space because it automatically integrates into any particular geographic area you're looking at, it integrates all the connections to the outside. You cannot look at a city without looking at the outside and anywhere outside cannot ignore the city. So in other words, the, uh, um, uh, the, this idea of intersecting trajectories, which is maybe a difficult one if you, if you haven't been uh, uh, thought about it for some time, I think it's a very powerful one to begin to uh, uh, at least have a, have a different way, a new way of thinking about spaces in cities and thinking about cities themselves, which incorporates both their existence as meeting places and as markets, because they do exist and they have a physical existence as meeting places, as markets, and of course as places of residence, but also every resident, every person who comes to that meeting place brings with them all their external networks and then will project whatever they buy, whatever they learn, onto these networks as they carry on communicating with them. Um, I'm not pretending to have gone over the full implications or even that what I suggested is necessarily uh, true in inverted commas. What I have done is raised a number of questions about job location. And if you go away with one idea, it's the questions that I've asked, not necessarily the answers that I've tried to give, but the questions about what do we mean by space and what do we mean by job location in an era where we don't even know where economic activity occurs, I think that is a key question that we need to ask. Finally, there are always inertial forces at play, so however much things are changing, things also say the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, creo que Richard ha abierto muchas, nos ha platicado muchas cosas que están pasando ahora y que nos hacen pensar nuevos, con, nuevos conceptos y nuevos fenómenos. Y entonces abrimos la, la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Como les decía, las preguntas pueden ser en español y mis compañeros que se van a acercar con el micrófono van a tratar de traducirlas. ¿Sí? ¿Ahí atrás? So I should start saying that I'm not an uh, expert on urban issues, so I hope that the questions I'm going to make are not too basic. The, the first one has to do with uh, the first point on this, on this, last slide, on this last slide. So you are suggesting that the way we traditionally measure labor is not useful now to look at all these emerging processes. Um, so I would like to know whether it, in, and, and in fact it's pretty standard the way uh, it's international measured. No? All the labor statistics, have, there has been a lot of work in terms of the labor indicators and, and, and how they have standardized across countries. So I don't know if you have any suggestion on new ways of measuring uh, um, labor statistics, or so these kind of emerging processes. The second question I have has to do with the uh, use of time. Uh, use of? The, the use of time. Okay. Um, there, there has been um, a set of rounds on national surveys on the use of time in Mexico that I had been, uh, I've seen the, the work that's been done with them basically on how family organizes and, and etc. But um, you were talking about the geography of time at a certain point of your presentation. So to what extent you can include or approach, for example, it from the time perspective or how time intersects with space within all this argument. And the last question I have has to do with uh, unpaid labor. No? In fact, a lot of these surveys on the use of time are focused on unpaid labor. And to what extent all, all the focus of your argument goes 
uh, related to um, paid jobs. No? So to what extent there is a similar argument or how can you integrate all this other perspective of unpaid labor that has its own logic in, 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 in mobility, I suppose, all the social reproduction of the household, the care work, etc. So whether it's a similar or parallel argument that integrates this other part of unpaid labor. Okay. Um, Um, I, I prefer to answer questions one at a time, otherwise I get mixed up. Um, in, in terms of, of labor statistics, I think that there, there are two things. I think the international efforts to measure labor have often been done, uh, uh, been performed in trying to classify labor by occupation and by, um, uh, by economic sector. Um, and more and more it's occupations which are, 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 are maybe more relevant than economic sectors, I would say. Um, but unfortunately, not much effort has is, is, is really gone into measuring the location of employment. And I think that that is, is, is very poorly standardized and often completely ignored by uh, um, at least some completely ignored. No, we can often work out uh, at the municipal level where, where jobs are. But in many countries, getting below that is, is very difficult. In fact, I think Mexico has a very uh, remarkably good uh, geographic uh, um, uh, sort of system to identify where jobs are located with all the caveats that I've mentioned in terms of where they actually are. Many countries we don't even have that amount of information but I think that the international efforts have been not on location more on how you classify jobs and how you characterize um, occupations and also the knowledge content of particular occupations. Um, the, the, the second point about the, uh, the use of times and, and th th there are constraints, and I think that um, this is where Hagerstrand is actually very uh, interesting. One of the, the um, things that has come out of time geography is the fact that uh, certain uh, people who have constraints, and it's often been women, because they have to be at a particular point in space and time to pick up children at the end of the day um, and to deliver them in the morning. And the, these uh, fixed constraints actually have been argued to be a, a limitation on the opportunities, uh, particularly for women or indeed for men, if they're the ones who are looking after the children. Now, what I'm saying, and when I say that this mobility may actually increase polarization, I think that it's precisely because those people who are constrained won't be able to take advantage of the um, processes which I've described. But it's often assumed that you can. It's often assumed, oh, you know, you can make it to this meeting place at this particular time you can make it to this conference. And those of us who have to sometimes refuse invitations or say, well, I can't make it, are actually at a disadvantage. And I think what I'm saying here is that, is that this actually now may be going uh, uh, beyond the um, household reproduction constraints, which Hagerstrand uh, and people who've worked after him have, have, have underlined, to actually more, more general constraints, um, whereby uh, those individuals who are not willing to play this game of mobility are the ones who are gonna have less power. Uh, or, or, uh, or less opportunities, and opportunities may be decided on whether or not you are available. So I think there's there definitely a downside to what I'm describing, because it does mean that you have to make more choices between am I going to be at home for my kids, or am I going to be joining in this sort of interconnected uh, mobile world? Uh, and I do think that those are, are, are tensions which are building. Um, finally, uh, unpaid labor. Well, first of all, unpaid labor uh, quite often within the household ha has its own geography and, and it doesn't actually take place, unpaid labor is not just within the household, it's of course you leave the house to go and do your shopping, you go and pick up the kids, you look after your parents, so even though the scale of which usually unpaid labor is, uh, is functioning is, is at a smaller one than, than I've been describing, unpaid labor doesn't just take place inside four walls and there is a geography to that um, which um, you know, to some extent, maybe this mobile technology will, will, will make things easier because if all the kids have mobile phones and the parent has a mobile phone, you can sort, you know, and, and then uh, the, 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 the parent looking after the kids has to leave. They can actually tell the kids, look, I'm not going to be home when you get back, whereas before you couldn't do that. It, was, it, was, it may actually facilitate things, um, but I, I'm not sure it will fundamentally change anything. It won't make uh, this unpaid labor any less or any more paid or any less uh, unrecognized, if you will. So. Uh, Richard, do you think uh, 
these uh, processes of change will occur more in the larger cities than in smaller cities. Will there be more opportunities to use uh, mobile communication technologies in larger cities? And especially in terms of uh, these uh, high status uh, uh, jobs, as well as all these uh, um, uh, ideas of um, uh, surrounding uh, one, some activities with a lot of uh, ancillary jobs uh, that uh, will have more opportunities in, or are more uh, concentrated in, in large uh, cities or in metropolitan mm -hmm. uh, areas. I, I completely agree that the, what I've been describing are, are really processes which are, are probably beginning to occur in metropolitan areas far more than in smaller cities. I think in smaller cities the impact is, uh, it, it's less the mobile technology than internet which is having an effect on smaller cities. Um, uh, my, my most recent research has been on the way that small manufacturing firms access service uh, providers. And we see that when they're in, located in small uh, um, um, towns, increasingly they use the internet for two things. First of all, to identify potential providers. Before, they only had the yellow pages. Now they can go on the internet and go through all the engineering consultants in Mexico City and say, ha, ah, you know, if they're in a small city in northern Mexico, say, ha, ah, I have now found the five consultants who know something about my, uh, my, um, my problem, they can then arrange to meet them and they travel once down to Mexico City, they have all their meetings arranged, they know what, uh, they've got quite a lot of information from the internet. They do need to travel down to Mexico City to meet these consultants, choose the ones who they're going to work with. And the second way of using internet is then when they go back to their hometown, they can do a lot of the day-to-day -day communication with their consulting firms via internet. So this is not mobile technology. This is internet as a way of identifying collaborators or service providers and then as a way of communicating with them. What this does mean is that there is less requirement to have a local service industry because that service industry can be centralized and it can be accessed from the outside. So I think that technology is changing the way that uh, um, economic activity takes place in smaller cities. It is also linked to mobility because you are traveling, but not on a day-to-day -day basis, not on this sort of uh, uh, um, uh, choreography described by Barry and Wellman, which I think is a metropolitan phenomenon. What we're talking about here is a, a longer-term mobility. We, we travel down, establish contacts, but then can maintain those contacts uh, remotely. So there are changes, but not the ones I've described for smaller cities. Can I change my question? You go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would like a perhaps to explain uh, uh, to us uh, how would you think this idea of uh, trajectories, intersect, intersection trajectories would be expressed or where, where would we find intersect, intersection trajectories? Well. Uh, Okay. okay, I think you'll, you'll find them in a place like this right now. You've, you'll find them in a lot of headquarter offices where, you know, uh, basically this is where if you have a, a headquarters uh, you know, in Mexico City, uh, people from the company may travel in, meet, travel out again. On a more local basis, um, and I'm not talking, you know, talk within the city, you will often find them, you know, in, in cafes. People, you know, I often meet up for working uh, meetings with people in, in a cafe. So we, we will meet in the cafe, have our discussion, and move on. And I think that the, there's headquarter offices, or, you know, these, these companies still have addresses, and those addresses are where people meet. Uh, but not necessarily where they uh, produce the knowledge or produce uh, uh, whatever they're producing, but it's where they, uh, um, uh, where they have their meetings, or in places of entertainment. Um, you know, these the entertainment places are places where you find restaurants, where you find cafes, uh, where you often find hotels. And often there's a mixture between the hotel industry, the restaurant industry, uh, the, the cafe industry, between entertainment, that's to say people coming to have fun, and people 
uh, meeting for business reasons. Finally, airports are an increasing uh, place where these meetings occur. Voy a, voy a, lo voy a decir en español y lo voy a traducir. De, eh, a, para aquellos que no son geógrafos o no, no están estudiando este tipo de cosas, eh, sugiero, porque mencionó Richard a Hagerstrand, y sugiero que se vayan a un, libr, un librazo de, de, de quién es, de Anthony Giddens, de Structuration of Society, y ahí él tiene un capítulo eh, que se llama Tiempo y Espacio, ¿no? algo así, no me acuerdo exactamente la cosa, para que eh, eh, desde otra perspectiva no geográfica o no eh, de, de esta naturaleza eh, puedan ver ese asunto. Y lo estoy pensando porque eh, lo que decía, la, la diferencia, the difference between eh, Hagerstrand, I'm just trying to bring in uh, some people that are not geographers. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. eh, el, eh, Hagerstrand habla de geografía del tiempo, ¿no? Time geography. Mm -hmm. So, eh, the, the difference be, between you, the intersection of trajectories and, and the mobility that, the model that you are proposing for mobility, eh, but, eh, you mentioned the, uh, the difference between Hagerstrand Maybe because Hagerstrand didn't count on technology, uh, tick on technology. Uh, absolutely, and, I think and so that's the reason why, because th there is f fixed uh, intersection yeah. of trajectories in Hagerstrand model. Yeah, fixed. Yeah, I mean that's right, and I think that's a big difference. The Hagerstrand assumed that people went to fixed places. Uh, and uh, the, his model is often about you know, uh, the access to job opportunities. The jobs were at a fixed place. The question was, if you had less constraints, you could actually travel further, commute further to get. And when Hagerstrand looked at um, uh, 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 people who were tied to households, particularly women, he found that because they were constrained at the beginning and the end of the day, they had a far smaller job search radius. And if you add to that shopping and other things, um, The idea behind Hagerstrand is fixity of places where people are going to. Um, and what I'm saying, I think Hagerstrand can quite easily be uh, updated, but when you into, uh, include mobile technology, it becomes more complicated. But definitely, you know, I think if, if, if you want to find out what Hagerstrand wrote, you'll find that there's many very interesting things in time geography which link in with, with, with what I've been saying. Eh, voy a hablar en español. Eh, estaba pensando en la pregunta que hizo aquí atrás acerca de cómo se podrían medir los, digamos, estas trayectorias o la movilidad que está relacionada con el trabajo. Y recordé que en la encuesta Origen y Destino de la zona metropolitana del Valle de México se incorpora un motivo de viaje que es justo este, relacionado con el trabajo, ¿no? Viaje relacionado con el trabajo. Eh, en el caso de la zona metropolitana. Trabajamos esa encuesta hace unos años en Coajimalpa y era una mínima parte del total de los viajes que se desarrollaban de forma cotidiana en la zona metropolitana. Sin embargo, nosotros hicimos una revisión de diferentes encuestas de origen y destino y hay cada vez más encuestas que incorporan este, esta categoría. Si bien está limitada, digamos sigue estando un poco fijo en el espacio local, podría ser una ventana de oportunidad para analizar este tipo de viajes y en algunos casos se llega a desagregar al tipo de, de espacios a los cuales se dirigen. Entonces, creo que eso podría ser una buena oportunidad. One difference that she's making is that in the, uh, in the survey, mm -hmm. you have two questions, uh, jo uh, trips, for work mm -hmm. or trips for motivos de trabajo. Yeah. Okay? Reasons of work. Reasons of work. Yeah. Work related mobility or uh, trips or commuting, mm -hmm. house to work. So there's a little difference there. Yeah. And the, the second one is small, but it, that might open a possibility. That's a, a, a 
Yeah, because the main question was that the, um, it, how you could measure this mobility using this kind of service. And she said this, that yeah. um, in different services, she finds that more and more are appearing like these questions about the reasons for mobility and the reasons for uh, or just commuting or different quest or different yeah. aspects about mobility. Uh, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, I think that measurement is, is problematic and the in it, it a lot depends on how people understand the question in the OD survey because um, as I understand that question, when I'm looking at it in OD surveys, I assume that people have gone to their work and then during the day they travel around and they will say, well, yes, between nine in the morning and six in the evening, these are the travels I made for work motive. The problem with what I've been describing, um, and in fact, I think it's just on the previous slide, is the overlap between work, I said play, but work and non-work, if you will. Um, and how do people who are spending most of their day at home but meet somebody in a cafe and, 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 and talk about work, how do they talk about that? How, how, how is that uh, described? Um, how is uh, are people who are, say, working at home three days a week and then traveling up to a metropolitan area two days a week, they will say that they're immobile for, uh, and they are immobile for uh, a few days, how, how is that picked up in OD surveys? I think that you're right that OD surveys could be useful, um, but they need to, some of the questions need to be thought through with this in mind. I think, I think it, as you say, it can provide interesting uh, um, insights, but I think what we really need is to, uh, if these ideas are, are valid, to then talk with the people who are doing the surveys and think through, well, what questions can we ask to capture this sort of mobility? Um, you've suggested one, and I think it's a, an interesting one, but I'm not sure how it's interpreted by the people who, who answer it. Yeah, I don't think it's very well interpreted, and maybe that's the reason that it's under... Yeah. Okay. Lo voy a en español. Este... Las conclusiones que tú muestras en tu trabajo... Eh, tienes una parte que resaltas the higher social status is for the uh, this term the new mobility in in, in other cities in, Mex in Mexico eh, como lo dijo mi compañera hace rato les, les encuesta de origen y destino tienen una, una pregunta un apartado de motivos de viaje por trabajo que es creo que el quinto o la sexto motivo de viaje En México el primer motivo de viaje es trabajo, el segundo motivo de viaje es educación, el tercer motivo es consumo y otros. Yo la pregunta que te quiero hacer es, bueno, eh, una conclusión es una nueva, una nueva forma de entender el espacio a partir de esta dinámica de la nueva movilidad. Pero resaltando la pregunta sería, pero entonces cómo deberíamos, cómo se debería o cuál sería el eje de concebir esa nuevo, ese, ese espacio o esa nueva movilidad en donde, la, donde los estratos sociales son diferentes. En el resultado de tu trabajo, tú expones que, se, que los, el, trabajo se, el orden del, del trabajo se especializa aún más debido al nivel de desastre social. Pero en las ciudades latinoamericanas esto puede ser diferente. Y por, y por consecuencia, la concepción del espacio y de la movilidad también tendría que ser diferente. Entonces, la economía global, hay una contradicción ahí de cómo concebirla. No, no sé si me explico la pregunta. Okay. La pregunta es, bueno, ¿tú cómo lo ves? Have you just, uh, again, clarify for me. Well, um, he was asking, uh, how could you understand this kind of new mobility that is associated with the change in the status of work and of uh, especially with this uh, change of high, uh, high uh, knowledge work mm -hmm. that is uh, really associated with uh, new, these new kinds of mobility and if uh, I don't understand the last part of the question but if it's the but I'm sure that you can do it <laughs> that uh, if 
is there a contradiction between this new mobility and this high uh, knowledge work or this new kind of labor force with the global market economy? And if, is there a contradiction there? Um, well, I, th I think first of all, the the and with the if is there any different implications for Latin American cities? Yes. Right. Well. I, I, th I think that, that, first of all, it's important that, uh, as you mentioned, that we're talking about new kinds of mobility and not necessarily more mobility. Um, and what really is associated with high social status is the flexibility of where to meet and the choice of whether to travel or not. The lower down you go, the less flexible you get. I was uh, last night caught in traffic jams in Mexico City and I was told that you know, some people commute from north of Mexico City to the south, it takes them three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. They are very mobile, but what they have is constraints. Now, if they could choose whether to drive down or not, or could only do it on a few days in the week, then they would, be, they would have power uh, and, and, and they, they could uh, um, uh, modulate their mobility because of the power they have in, in the workplace. The people who have to commute and have no choice and they have to go to a fixed place uh, don't have the power that I've been describing. Now, what is the link with the uh, uh, global uh, economy? Well, one of them is the fact that a lot of global actors, and this is uh, people who have read the um, work on postmodern urbanism by Michael Deere um, and um, Steve Flusty, will uh, be aware that this is one of the things that they uh, have been mentioning, is that increasingly, particularly for uh, uh, globalized activity, what's really important are connections to the outside. Um, one of the arguments that they're making is that the internal spatial structure of cities is no longer really uh, um, determined by internal dynamics, is determined by uh, the choices made relative to the outside. So what this means is that people who are really connected to the outside will locate closer to the uh, airports, uh, maybe in, in distant suburbs or maybe even in rural areas which allow them good access to the airport, but won't necessarily seek out centrality in the city. And these are the people who may choose to work at home for two or three days a week, then go and catch an aeroplane and go to where they have to go and come back. So there is a connection. One of them is, is that the, the power that these individuals have is no longer associated with their locality. This is what Sigmund Bauman is talking about, where he's saying that, in fact, the elites are less and less attached to place. And, and one of the uh, points that he makes in his book is that it used to be historically that to be powerful, you had to own land, you had to control a space. Now, power is being able to get out of that space as soon as things go wrong, uh, uh, is not being attached to space. And I think that there is a, a connection with uh, global power structures and what I've been describing. It would take me a long time to go into it in detail, but I think if you look at what Sigmund Bauman has written, he does really mention how this detachment from space is increasingly, or from particular places, I should say, is uh, an attribute of a global elite. And what I'm describing is how some of this global elite is maybe functioning inside a city. Um, finally, are there, are there particular things about Latin American cities? Well, first of all, I was very careful to talk about North American and European cities because I'm not a specialist on Latin American cities. Um, but I would suggest that uh, you need to um, think about the place that manufacturing takes, for example, because clearly I'm talking from a perspective where manufacturing jobs are declining and a, a, a residual category in a lot of North American cities. Um, I believe that even in Mexico City, there still is quite a lot of manufacturing activity, although it's declining. Now, these are definitely place, uh, jobs that have a um, fixed location. I think the other thing is that the, um, what, what I'm describing, well, for, for, for the whole of the city to be used in the way I'm describing, um, we are supposing there's quite, the, the, the transport systems work fairly well and there's not too much congestion. Um, there is congestion in North American cities, there's maybe more congestion in, in, these, in some very large uh, Latin American cities, which may mean that these meeting places will actually be focused in, in suburban locations, or like this one, or like Santa Fe, or places which are close to high um, amenity uh, areas. So there, there still is a geography to all of this, which is uh, limited by accessibility to airports, to high amenity uh, places, and that may well be different in, uh, in Latin American cities. But I think really what, I, what I'm sort of inviting 
you uh, to do, but also if I was presenting this to uh, North American or Canadian colleagues, it would be the same thing, is to say, okay, here are some ideas which rest upon some recent sociological work. Well, do they apply to Mexico City and how, how do you need to adapt them? Um, maybe they make no sense at all in Latin American cities. I think any ideas, including the ones I'm presenting, you have to look at critically. Um, you know, does it make sense in the context within which you're working or not? Um, I can't answer that. Um, and I'm quite prepared for you to say that this is all rubbish, you know, but uh, these are some ideas which I'm putting forward. It's, uh... I, well, I have a question. I would like to ask you Hola. Este, quería preguntar si, como tú planteaste, es utópico pensar en la relocalización del trabajo cerca de las áreas residenciales, si es el transporte esta, pues, la única vía para resolver la desigualdad entre los viajes, como tú decías ayer, de personas que hacen tres horas de camino a su trabajo. O sea, si no se puede relocalizar el trabajo hacia los espacios residenciales, solo es el transporte el que podría reducir esta desigualdad. Gracias. You know, if you could, uh, <laughs> How could we, um, if is there no possibility to attach like work to the neighborhood in mm -hmm. different areas, if is the transportation an alternative to relocate jobs and housing? Yeah. Is the only, is the only way you can reduce inequalities mm -hmm. or cost or, yeah. or differences? Well, I, I, I think that's, that's a very good uh, question because it, 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 this is something in which it is a, uh, a corollary, if you will, of my, uh, uh, my belief um, that local jobs, housing balance is something which is, is, is utopic in, uh, in a metropolitan area. So the alternative as you quite rightly point out, could be to um, have a better transport system that allow people to travel around at low cost to reach opportunities. Um, I think that these, uh, I think this is very important, particularly for access to what I've called uh, um, immobile jobs. Um, because these are the jobs where we often see people who are earning very low salaries commuting very, very long distances because they go and work in, in wealthy neighborhoods or wealthy entertainment districts, but they have to go back in the evening to work in very poor neighborhoods. And I think it's the, these people who are at the lower end of the socioeconomic um, spectrum who are also at the lower end of the mobility spectrum in, in terms of choice. Remember that for me mobility is associated with choice. You are highly mobile if you can choose where you move and choose where you work. You are immobile if you cannot choose where you work. I'm not saying you don't move. I'm saying that you have to move which is uh, uh, and, and therefore as a, a measure to um, attenuate um, inequality particularly because of, um, uh, I think there's an increasing um, special mismatch between jobs because you have the, the uh, people who live in the poorer neighborhoods often go and work in the richer neighborhoods to do all these service jobs. Um, I think a, a cheap and efficient uh, public transport network is, is, a, is a, a key measure, um, which is something different from what I've been talking about of the high end of mobility, which is a question of choice and of opportunity and of playing with technologies, saying do we meet or do we do a video conference. That's at the higher end. I haven't spoken much about the mobile, the, the immobile jobs, and I think you're quite right. Public transport is a key for that because you are not going to move the service jobs in the wealthy neighborhoods to the poor neighborhoods. It's, it's not going to happen. What you need is to make the workforce be able to get to those neighborhoods easily. Ah, ok, este, ya, ya me regañaron que ya me pasé, <risa> estaba muy entretenida en las preguntas, este, damos por cerrada esta, esta conferencia magistral, le queremos entregar a Richard un reconocimiento por haber venido, muchas gracias, thank you Richard.